Hello, welcome back. Okay, this is part two of answering your questions from the NAEA Choice um, webinar. So this section will focus on kind of some of the logistics that people asked, the grading assessment and feedback, some vertical alignment from K through um, high school, and then some other questions that you have. Part three will focus um, maybe on COVID and the demo of my Canvas. Okay. So, um, okay, let me scroll down here. Okay, logistics. So answering these questions. Um, where and how do I host my web pages? Any resources for templates new to tech? So um, I think you're asking about how I support my students. What is my learning management system? And I use Canvas because that is what our school district is set up on. Um, using Canvas, I do use a lot of Google sources. So I'll use um, or resources. So I'll use Google Slides and link those. I will use Google Docs and link that. Um, I use Google Slides to embed my agenda that you saw on that homepage. So all of those um, resources are Google, but we use Canvas as our learning management system. Um, what was the learning platform technology you showed? Um, so I will show that more specifically. That's exactly as Canvas. Um, do you set deadlines? How do your students manage finishing their work in a timely way? Um, so I answered this a little bit in the previous um, answers video and that is um, kind of dependent on what it is they're creating so yes I set deadlines but not really also <laughs> um, so that doesn't really help you I realize but my students in their toolboxes I usually I have found that the way I have scaffolded it and structured it students typically and maybe because they're working kind of in smaller groups and they're seeing what each other is making and they're helping each other um, they typically do work at the same pace um, if some students I'll notice that might be straggling on one toolbox but then I know they'll catch up on the next one they'll go a little faster maybe or I'll talk to them about that too like hey you know this is fine if you want to, sometimes they want to make like artworks in their toolboxes. They get so excited. They're like, I want to make this elaborate piece. And I'm like, that's awesome. But just know that this is not your artwork phase. This is a technical skill phase. Like I want you to practice, practice, practice. This is safe practice time. And just know that you could take this idea and you could focus on it now. You might not have as much time to make your artwork later. Or you can like uh, table that idea for your artwork phase. And so I'll kind of push that onto that. And a lot of times kids will be like, yeah, I, you're right. I just, I'll hold on to this then and I'll make it, you know, later. And sometimes I'll say like, you know, and just think of all the other techniques and ideas you'll have by the time you go to create that artwork. Cause by then you'll have more tools in your toolbox, right? Now you'll be able to solder and maybe you'll think of a different way to, um, you know, join those pieces or whatever it is. Um, as far as like artwork, so when it gets to artwork, that deadly, uh, deadly, that deadline, <laughs> deadline is deadly. Um, that deadline sometimes can be tricky. So sometimes students create that really elaborate piece um, that they're working on and they're working really hard on it. So what, but they just don't hit that end of the semester deadline or whatever. I tell them it's okay. If they are working every single day to develop their skill and their craft and, and think about conceptual ideas, that again is the point of the class. Um, if they don't fulfill their end of the semester artwork, then they reflect on that in their growth portfolio. Sometimes students will say, well, I'm not taking jewelry to next semester. What can I do? And I say, you can come in and finish it. It's fine. We can set up some times. You can come during your lunch, whatever. Um, you just need to communicate that with me. Some students I know are taking Jewelry 2 next semester, and I can say, it's okay. You could start off by working on that in Jewelry 2 um, and finish that up, or you can pause it and maybe have more ideas later, and that's okay too. Um, that's just how artists work, right? We don't always finish everything. Sometimes we abandon um, artworks. Sometimes we put them to the side so that we can think more about them or come back to them with fresh eyes. I want my students to have that ability to do that without the risk. I understand that a lot of teachers <clears throat> have a lot of control over deadlines. And I will have to say this is just, it's either something you have to figure out for you and what's going to work for you, or maybe you 
realize that you're not quite a, as flexible at letting some things go. It always comes back to what do I value and what do I know in my outcomes and goals that I set, right? I need to sit there and say, what's more important, that my student has this finished or is it more important that they've learned and grown? And um, if a student is not working in my classroom and that's why they didn't finish, that's a whole different story. But I tell you, when you walk into my classroom, most kids are on task because they're excited to be there and excited to learn. Um, when they're not, that gives me opportunity to go and talk to them and find out why. A lot of times it could be that they're frozen and stuck. They don't know what to do next and they're scared. It could be that they're having an emotional day. It could be that they have a big math test to next period and they're nervous about that. So there's a lot of different ways um, or reasons why students might not be on task. But what's great about a choice classroom is students are all kind of buzzing around. So it gives you the opportunity to actually address some of those needs in your classroom. <clears throat> um, how many staff members are in your department? Do all the teachers have combined classes? So yeah, so we have, I was trying to figure this out the other day, I think four, four and a half teachers in our school. The other school has five and a half. Um, and we all have mostly combined classes. Most of our level ones, like we might have a teacher who kind of grabs onto all, a bunch of different media, um, like usually the newer teacher is kind of learning the ropes. So when I started off, even at North, even though I had experience, right, I taught a lot of the level ones, which I actually love teaching, by the way. Um, but they will teach, you know, because there's enough kids in those level one classes to fill that out. Oftentimes, teachers will teach just a level one, like a drawing one like two sections of drawing one, they'll teach a photo one, you know, um, something like that. The other combined courses are typically more advanced courses because they get smaller numbers, so they're usually more um, combined. How long are your classes? I'm assuming you mean by period, so ours are, should know this, 50 minutes long, and um, we have semester-long courses. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, did you say you're working on Canvas with students? Um, I am working on Canvas with students and I'm going to show that. So that's a good question. Um, do you have any tips on making technique demos videos for students? Technique demos are still one thing I do with whole class instruction because I find it challenging to make a vi quality video without spending an unreasonable amount of time making it. I totally agree with you. And half the time I'm like, shoot, I forgot to say this or I forgot to say that. Um, I actually find a lot of great demo videos. And what I like about that is I might show, you know, even for the same technique, I might show two different videos. And what I like about that is that there's showing students and modeling that there's always different ways to approach something that it's not just this is the only way um, so I might do a demo video or um, my colleague if you follow her on on YouTube um, Janelle Modest J-A-N-E-L-L-M-A-T-A-S um, she is like incredible at doing demo videos she'll demo them in her class and video them while she's demoing them for the class and then the kids have that as a resource later but also she can maybe flip her classroom or it's perfect for you know remote learning she can utilize all those videos that she's already put in her bank so um i would highly suggest checking her out and following her um she always says like it's not the best video and i'm like who cares it's great you know it's um she does it in front of like her elmo in class um, and then she's got it and that just uploads it. Um, but I agree. It takes forever for me to do demo stuff. Um, it takes a long time for me to do technique, um, or to upload that and do all of that. So I tend to find a lot of different resources out there that I can support my students with. And then if I want to demo something in class, I'll just demo that in class. Um, so a little bit of a combined. I might say even a good example would be I might show a couple videos on how to do something. And then the next day I'll say, okay, you guys watch the videos. Now I'm going to show you how I would like you to learn this. Now we all know that there's multiple ways to do this, but this is the way that works for me. And so I'm going to teach you this way. 
But based on what you learned and based on what you're going to figure out as you go, you get to decide how you're going to do this, okay, or what works best for you. Um, but right now I want you to learn my way and practice it my way so that I know that you're at least understanding the concept. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, how do your students photograph their work for submission through Canvas and their growth portfolio? My students always take terrible photos with their laptop cameras and I have uh, find I have to rummage through their class folders to access their work. Really good question. Yes, I laugh because yes, terrible, terrible, terrible photos, even with their phones. I'm like, just put it on a plain background. Why is there like textbooks in the background and somebody like photobombing? I don't understand it. Like this is your artwork, right? In my classroom, I set up a, a couple years ago, a very small little station. It's like the display station is what I call it. And so students, I'll, I'll model them how to set up their artwork to take a photo. Now in the earlier years, um, I'm not as like concerned about it. Um, I also photograph all of their work so that I have that. Yes, it takes more time, but I will tell you, it's also great because then you have it for a resource for later for examples, but you also have it for social media purposes. Um, so I like to have all of that, but um, I do want my students to take their own photos. So I usually set up a little tiny backdrop. I'm, it's like maybe my space is maybe, you know, a couple feet wide or whatever. And then I put like a little um, backdrop or a piece of paper or something, and I have them set up their work and then they photograph that. Um, it's a challenge. Um, as they get older, I typically go through more specific um, ideas on how to do that the right way. Um, sometimes I teach individually and then if students struggling, I'll say like, hey, go talk to so-and-so. I just show them how to do this. Um, they do use their phones most because we have Chromebooks and their Chromebook um, cameras are really bad. Uh, quality. So I would suggest if they have phones, which they probably all do, I don't know what your phone policy is. My classroom, I'll tell you what, my phone policy is all kids get to use their phones at all times because they use it a lot. <laughs> it's hilarious because sometimes I'm like, walk up to a kid and I'm thinking like they're they're texting someone and I look over the show and I'm like what are you doing and they're like I'm I'm researching for my project I'm like okay okay <laughs> you know um so sometimes uh, you know they are texting their friends sometimes they are calling their mother whatever but like I try to manage that the best I can without taking it away I'm I'm just not a punitive like taker aware I don't know that's just me um I know it doesn't work for everybody but um, do you use bell ringers? I will only have 45 minute classes. So on studio days, I'd prefer they get right into it, but I am missing an element of structure students will need. Yeah. So I used to use bell ringers all the time. And here's what happened. My bell ringers, um, I had these great bell ringer sheets. Um, students answered questions on them and I'd post the question on and they'd write that down and then they'd write their answer. And by the end of the week, then they would turn in the sheet and they get points for that. I don't do that anymore because after weeks of them piling up because I never had time to like grade them or give them credit for that. Um, here's the problem with bell ringers for me. When it comes to that, I just will be honest about who I am. I cannot keep up with that feedback of small formative things like that, like a bell ringer, like a little slip. Um, when it comes to that, I feel like if you're going to do a bell ringer, the, it's not busy work. The point is a, to set up your class, I get that, right? So let's find another way. B, it's to ch do a formative check to see for, check for understanding. Um, but by the time you give them feedback for that, they have already moved on. And so that feedback is an instant. It doesn't help them. It took up your time for no reason. They probably won't even look at it. And you can formatively check them throughout the period to see if they're understanding. And you can give them instant feedback with your comments. Um, and I'll talk about that later. But um, so I don't use bell ringers. What I do do is I have my agenda projected on the board. And on the agenda, I, as you saw in the um, presentation, I have all the information. I have my learning target. I have what we're going to be working on today. I have probably an artwork image that relates to where they're at in the process. So I don't often reuse my agendas. I have like, you know long agenda, like long slides from each year 
that I go like, I should probably reuse this. But every year it's just a little bit different, right? It's hard to say, oh, this is what I'm going to do on this same day because my curriculum is flexible to my students. So if they're not in that same place on that day, why would I push that? Um, so I'll pick out an artwork or something that relates to what we're working on. If kids need, if I notice that they're struggling with composition, I might toss a couple images of how to use composition and I would ask the class. Um, we have a goal sheet. I use that goal sheet. Um, I can link that as well. Um, but we do a weekly goal sheet where the students come in. They have to um, kind of figure out where they were, where they're going today, what questions they have. Um, what successes that they had at the end of the period. So it's kind of like my bell ringer, like first and, but it's solely for them. They do turn it in just to, for me to check and see how they're making their goals. And if those goals that are not good, I try to explain to them, this is why your artwork is struggling. It's because you're not sure what you're working on today. We talk about goal setting. Again, this is all executive functioning for life skills. You know, how do you set your daily goals? How are you going to make them achievable? How do you not be overwhelmed by all the things in your life that you have to do because I know I never got that and I struggle with that, right? So I want to make sure my students are set up for that. Um, so those are ways that I start and end my class that feel authentic to what I'm teaching and integrating everything I explicitly talk about all into it as opposed to something that's just I'm doing because it feels like I should do it, not because it's actually working. Um, I have the whole school, over 200 kids, middle school and high school, and now lower school. Probably 15 to 12 to 15 different classes. Suggestions? This is best way to work remotely using tab. Do you have examples of choice boards you can share? Okay, so wow, that's a lot of kids. Um, that's a lot of kids <laughs> to work with um, at the middle school and high school level and now integrating like the lower school. Um, so how do you take your 12 to 15 different classes? Well, you know, it's crazy because I chose this last year to go part time um, so that I could work with, be with my own children at home a little bit more. Um, and within the three class periods that I teach, I have 11 preps. So 11 different quote unquote courses. So it's a lot and I get that. Um, so how do you structure that? How do you not make, how do you make it doable? Um, it's a lot of work up front, but I will tell you that I use my courses semester after semester. I do change things along the way for what's working. I assess and go like, does this work? Does it not work? Whatever. But I think that, um, Hmm. I think that this is a really good question for maybe me to mull on and think about how maybe I need more information about your situation to help you think about how to process that for your kids. So maybe whoever asked me that can reach out to me and I'd be happy to talk with you as well. Um, best way to remote to work remotely using tab. Um, well, I'm going to show you how I set up my canvas and um, how I did it through COVID. I'm going to show you both of those things. So um, there's that maybe that will help. And then do you have examples of choice boards that you can share? So I actually just started using choice boards for the very first time in remote setting. Um, so I'm happy to share with those, share with you with those um, as well. So I can do that in a little bit too. Okay. All right. I'm going to pause here. Um, actually, we're going to make this a multi-step because this is so long. Grading, assessment, feedback, alignment, and other.